Happy Halloween, Starfighters. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah. I I'm glad you noticed. Uh, this is, in fact, a Dagger of Amon Ra pin designed by a YouTuber pushing up roses. It was available for a limited time on her Etsy store. I was lucky enough to get one. But, uh, you know, I'm going to include a link to her channel in the show notes. It's definitely worth checking out if you like um, adventure games from the 90s, Murder, She Wrote, or The Golden Girls. Anyway, welcome to the Season 3 wrap-up, thank goodness, of Shameless Cash Grab. There were some good movies in this set, I will admit, but 20 movies. Yeah, I think I've said before, I'll say it again, I am definitely not doing that again. But uh, for those of you, if this is your first season wrap-up, if you didn't see the first two, what happens is I rank the movies from worst in set to best in set. I only compare them against each other. And then uh, at the end, I announce... Well, normally I announce what's coming up for the next season, but I'm actually not going to be doing that this time. I'm going to be announcing for the next two seasons. So anyway... Let's go ahead and get this started. Number 20, The Vampire Happening. Shabalon's Worst. Number 19, The... No, no. I'm going to say something this time. I just needed a minute. Okay. I will say this for The Vampire Happening. And this is where my praise for the movie begins and ends. It is less painful to sit through than either My Mom's a Werewolf or The Beach Girls. Of course, as you may recall, I, I felt that undergoing a root canal was less uncomfortable than sitting through My Mom's a Werewolf. There, I did have anesthetic, so, but, you know, still. Number 19, The Blood of Dracula's Castle. John Carradine was way too good for this movie. It's just, you know, quite possibly the lamest on-screen Dracula I have ever seen. Yes, lamer than that one. I haven't actually seen that movie, so I'm not going to comment. Number 18, Count Dracula and his Vampire Bride. To sum this one up in one word, that would be disappointing. This was my first of the uh, iconic Dr Dracula Van Helsing movies with Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, and Oh boy, it was not a good place to start, let me tell you. I definitely wish I'd seen one of the earlier ones first, but that's just not how things worked out. Not to mention, the title is one whopper of a misnomer, because Dracula doesn't really get married in it, and there really isn't a singular vampire bride to speak of. The original title, The Satanic Rites of Dracula, was definitely much more appropriate for the film, and I am not sure why it was on the Mill Creek set under the different title. I stand by my working theory that this script started out life as just a regular satanic cult movie, and then Dracula and Van Helsing got shoehorned into it. But, um, yeah, I've already talked a little more about that than I usually do in the wrap-up episodes. These things are supposed to be pretty brief. So let's move on to... Number 17, Atom Mage Vampire! What can I say about Atom Age Vampire that I didn't say in the episode, huh? It's just... It's... Not terribly good. The vampire connection is tenuous at best, although... There are movies ahead of this that actually have even less of one, but at least those have other things going for them. This is just... Eh. It is probably the most meh movie in the bottom half. Also, it doesn't help that it was clearly chopped up in editing. Number 16, Horrible Sexy Vampire, a.k.a. The Vampire of the Highway. Uh -huh. 
Another movie with a misnomer of a title, because the vampire in it wasn't really sexy at all, and his deeds were certainly horrible, but the movie kind of sells it as being worse than it is. I'm not really sure I'm describing that right. Nothing he did was particularly scary, just more sort of standard fare for a vampire movie. But, yeah, again, the horrible, sexy vampire was really, truly only one of those things. That being a vampire. Number 15, Crypt of the Living Dead, a.k.a. Hannah, Queen of the Vampires. Hannah. Becky. Crypt of the Living Dead, a.k.a. Hannah, Queen of the Vampires, is certainly a movie. Not much more to say about it than that. Uh, the pacing's not great. Uh, filming it in color and then converting it to black and white really didn't seem to serve any purpose and didn't do the movie any favors. The hero wasn't particularly likable. Just, there are definitely worse movies on this set, so I can't be too hard on it, but it's just... It's, it's not great. It's, it's really not great. In fact, I'll be honest with you, apart from the odd choice to convert to black and white and the unlikable hero, there's really not much I remember about the movie. It did not leave that much of an impression, like, at all. Number 14, The Witch's Fountain. This is just water, folks. I don't really... I mean, I drink, but I don't get drunk, and I'm certainly not going to get drunk over a bad movie. Speaking of... Oh, boy. The Witch's Mountain. Setting aside the fact that it's a bad movie for a second. That's a big thing to set aside, but go with me here. Um, why is it in this set? No, seriously. Why is it in this set? There is, like, nothing vampire-y about this. I mean, there are some movies coming up that have a very, very flimsy connection to vampire lore. But a flimsy connection is better than nothing, and Witch's Mountain offers a whole lot of nothing, especially in the boring-as-fuck first half. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like if Jerry was a vampire movie. Number 13, Prime Evil! It's, mm, what can I, mm, it, it's better than Lurkers. It is better than Lurkers, which was directed by the same person. It was a movie that I covered back in season one. Um, I, I mean, I kind of liked the villain. I think he deserved a better movie to be in. But other than that, with almost as little a vampire connection as the previous movie... And a not at all interesting story, and an incredibly disappointing visual effect for Satan it is just. It's, it's, it's. Yeah, I can't really recommend it to anyone who's like not like real hardcore collector of like 80s horror movies. Number 12 The Vampire's Night Orgy! Gross! Oh, God, I just realized we're not even out of the bottom half yet. Ugh. All right. Um, Vampire's Night Orgy. A title that is both stupid and inaccurate. Well, okay, I think it's stupid anyway, you know. You feel, feel free to disagree with me. But you know, it's just... Eh, but a, a, a title like that, you, you expect more than what I got, which was very little. It's just sort of... I, I don't even know where to start with this. It's just sort of... Eh, it's, it's, it's a vampire movie, and it's set in Europe. And it's a vampire movie that's set in Europe. That's really all I got for you. Number 11. Ooh, the Werewolf versus the Vampire Woman. You know, speaking of movies with... 
Well, no, it's not fair to say that the va werewolf versus the vampire woman had a misleading title. It actually had an awesome title. Unfortunately, you didn't get an awesome movie. To steal SF Debris' line about Star Trek Insurrection, it's not bad enough to be hated, but it's not bad enough to be loved. It's not, like, you know, a solid, mindless, but fun action movie, and it's not a riffable, MST3K-worthy, so-bad-it's-good kind of movie. It's just a movie. I mean... Number 10, The Bloody Vampire. You see, because bloody is a... You, yeah. The Bloody Vampire is okay. It's a uh, about an average example of Mexi Mexican cinema, which uh, is definitely something worth looking into if you're interested at all. Um... You know, the vampire's generic, but nothing particularly offensive about it. There's a potential for an interesting addition to the vampire mythos by giving us a vampire who is also addicted to caffeine. You know, it's, it's entirely possible that that's a dumb idea, and even a really good writer couldn't do anything with that. But I, I still like to think that there is some place you could take that that would be interesting. The Bloody Vampire really doesn't, but it also doesn't completely blow it either, so, you know, credit where credit's due. Number 9, The Bat, the 1926 version. Spooky! Okay, we're starting to get into the better stuff here. First off, the second of the two uh, silent films that were on this set. This movie was fun. I kind of have to knock it a lot, though, because, well, okay, a lot is being unfair, but I do got to knock it for the uh, the rather really, really unfortunate stuff with the yellow face, and also it has a few too many characters. Still, though, you can see how this movie went on to influence uh, things that came later, like Batman or the Clue movie, or at least I think it influenced the Clue movie. I probably... Should have looked that up before I said anything, but <laughs> hey, why start now? Number eight, The Devil Bat. It's Bella Lugosi. What, you were expecting me to say more? It's a Bella Lugosi movie. I mean, okay, he isn't playing a vampire in it, but still, it's Bella Lugosi. Number seven. Terror Creatures from the Grave! You ever see those movies that you judge it by its title? You just look at the title and assume that that movie can't possibly be good? This is one of those movies because Terror Creatures from the Grave is a movie that is not only better than its title would imply, it surpasses what its title would imply. It is very effective at what it does, and that's even with it being chopped to shit on the Milk Creek version. It's, it's atmospheric. The characters aren't, you know, too inhuman. You know, they're, they're relatable, even the ones who are kind of assholes. Uh, there's some really great makeup effects in it, especially for the time and budget that they had. This is an enjoyable little movie. Number six, The Bat. The 1959 version! It's over 30 years more spooky! The remake of The Bat wins for two reasons. I, I got into this in the video itself, so you probably, if you saw that, you already know what I'm going to say, but it's 100% less racist, and it has Vincent Price. Number five, The Vampire Bat! You wouldn't expect a movie from the 1930s called The Vampire Bat to be kind of deep. But it really is, because while it doesn't go into it too much, I think it can be forgiven because, you know, just how films were made at the time. It really does kind of explore the idea of, like, you know, the supernatural versus the scientific and also how bad people can take advantage of superstitious people to serve their own ends. You know, having the bad guy not actually be a vampire, but using the fact that people believe in vampires to his benefit, 
that is definitely a lot more than one would expect from like a vampire movie made well made today to be perfectly honest and this one was made in the 30s number four the horror express i'll get you your horror in three days or less of all the movies in the top five, Horror Express probably has the flimsiest connections to vampires, but I put it up here anyway just because it's just, it's good. It, it is really good. You know, you actually have Christopher Lee being on his A game, unlike in the previous movie in the set. Uh, Peter Cushing is really funny. Telly Savalas is Telly Savalas. Uh, the makeup effects are okay for the time and for budget. Uh, the setting is really well done, and it's even more impressive when you realize that this movie was basically rushed out because they had a train set left over from a previous movie, and they wanted to, you know, go ahead and use it before they had to dismantle it. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, a rush job, and a, yeah, yeah, it turned out great, and you know, if you can forgive the fact that Christopher Lee's name is misspelled in the opening credits, you're in for a good time with this one. Number three, Nightmare Castle. A lot of the praise I have for Nightmare Castle is fairly similar to praise I had for Horror Express with, you know, uh, budget and time and what they managed to do with setting. Nightmare Castle is very atmospheric. I think it does a great job with what little it has. Ultimately, I decided to go ahead and put it ahead of Horror Express, although I technically like Horror Express more, because Nightmare Castle managed to accomplish much of the same things as Horror Express, but with even less of a budget and less star power. So that is pretty impressive. So while it, like Horror Express, has a fairly flimsy vampire connection, I still feel pretty comfortable putting it this close to the top. Number two. Nosferatu! You know, the thing about Nosferatu is, is, it's a classic for a reason, but the thing about classic movies is that they get, to, they tend to get talked to death, really, and honestly, I bet if you spent five minutes searching on YouTube, you could find a half dozen videos that could tell you why that movie is good way better than I could. But yeah, it is definitely a classic for a reason, and I'm glad I've seen it. And it and uh, The Bat from the, the 1926 The Bat from earlier, it really does go to show why it is such a tragedy that so many films from the silent era are just gone. Number one, the last man on Earth. Oh man, the last man on Earth. This is just... Yeah, it's definitely a flawed movie. It could definitely use some improvement in terms of, you know, pacing and lighting and stuff like that. But at the same time, they were kind of... They were filming in a lot of locations they weren't supposed to and dealing with police and everything like that. But, you know, Vincent Price, he's a legend for a reason, and this movie is an example of why he's like that. This movie influenced so much that came after it, including, you know, George Romero and Night of the Living Dead. I mean, Romero has said straight up that he based his zombies on the vampires from The Last Man on Earth. Uh, it is definitely... Probably the most faithful adaptation of I Am Legend. And, you know, it's, it's just a good movie. I, I really enjoyed watching it. I, I don't know if I would go so far as to say it's better than Nosferatu, to be honest, but I had more fun watching it. And, again, you anytime you get Vincent Price in your movie, you're getting bonus points right there. And not only was he in this, he was in this. He was the lead He's like the only character with dialogue for much of it. And he carries the weight of just, you know, being just, you know, a lonely man in a post-apocalyptic world. He carries it so well. He is honestly a much better actor than I think even some of his fans appreciate. So, yeah. Last Man on Earth, number one, best movie, 
of Undead the Vampire Collection. So, there you have it. Undead the Vampire Collection. Uh, four really good movies, about four or five okay movies, and 11 movies that run the gambit from eh to eh. Was it worth it? I'm going to say nah. I mean, there were a couple movies on here that I probably wouldn't have seen otherwise, but there were others that I had planned on seeing eventually anyway. And, you know, the good ones on this set, I think most, if not all of them, have Blu-ray releases. So that means they come in better quality and, in some cases, more complete, because I think I've mentioned in previous episodes how some of these movies were clearly just cut down horribly with, like, whole probably important scenes missing. So, yeah, I would not recommend getting this set at all. Just, if any of the movies that I talked about, particularly in the top half, if they interest you, just find the Blu-ray. You could probably get them affordable, because, I mean, everybody goes digital these days anyway, so it's like it's actually rare to find super expensive Blu-rays anymore, too. So, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> you know, even with the good movies... Going 20 films for a season was a big mistake, and I am just glad it is over. And so, with that, season three comes to a close. But the episode's not over yet. It is time for that other famous shameless cash grab tradition, me announcing the next season of the show, or in this case, seasons. Now, why am I announcing the next two seasons? Simple. Both of them are short. Four movies a pop. 2010's actioners, 1940's mobster movies. Hell yeah, looking forward to these, or at the very least, looking forward to not having to do 20 of them. <laughs> yeah, sorry about the awkward jump cut there, it's just that wig was really, really itchy. So, um, yep, seasons four and five. I think, uh, uh, shout out to at Bread Millennial on Twitter. They're the artists that did the title cards you're about to see for seasons four and five. Special thanks to Greg from Isle of Rangoon for being the countdown voice for this episode. And, um, okay, uh, yeah, I will be seeing you in 2020, Starfighters. I'll probably put out maybe a Rants vs. Zombies episode or a couple of Let's Plays between now and then, but... Seriously, after that long-ass season I just, got, I just got through, I need a break.